Okay. So, yesterday, we were learning about the key features of exponential functions. In particular, we ended with this formula, that an exponential function is a function of the form f of x equals a times b to the x power. But what we really learned was we learned what the a and the b represent. First, we learned what the a represents. The a is the initial value where our function is starting, whereas b is the growth factor. What is the quantity, or by what quantity is the function being multiplied per time period? If a function doubles per time period, then that number would be two. If it triples, that number would be three. If it halves, so if it gets half as big, that number would be one half. Okay. So let's go ahead and get right to it. To, what we're going to do today is we are going to examine a bunch of real life situations and we're going to model them using and we're going to model them using this formula. So will anyone yell at me if I take this away? Okay. So let's start by talking about foodborne illness. You know, food poisoning. So what is food poisoning exactly? Well, food poisoning is what happens when you eat food that has been tainted with bacteria. In particular, the most common uh, bacterium that makes you sick is the bacterium Escheria coli, or just E. coli. Now, the way that it actually makes you, it makes you sick in a couple of ways. First, it's just bacteria makes you sick. Bacteria attack the cells in your body, and you need to use your immune system to attack. But Bacteria also produce toxins that uh, can permanently taint food. That's the reason why, if you even if you if you take a piece of rotten food and then you know cook it and kill all the bacteria, it's still not safe to eat because they because the bacteria produce toxins. But anyway, so before we go talk, you know, write out a math problem, let's think about what we already know about bacteria. So if I have some bacterium blobbing around here, it's more like an amoeba. E. coli is a pili bacteria, so it's pill-shaped. So if I have a bacterium, how does a bacterium make more bacteria? How do they reproduce? Does anyone know? Bacteria reproduce by splitting. When a, bact a bacterium absorbs things from its environment, gets bigger, but when it is ready, it splits in a process called mitosis. So this is an example of exponential growth. Every generation, the population doubles. 
So it goes from one to two. To eight. To 16 and so on. Now it takes about 20 minutes for E. coli to split. So the first generation takes 20 minutes. To get to the second generation, we need to wait. Or to go from first generation one to two, it takes 20 minutes. To go from to go from two to three, it takes 40 minutes. Or to go from one to three, it takes 40 minutes. To go from one to four, it takes 60 minutes. So what this means is that E. coli bacteria will multiply their population by eight every hour. Now this is under ideal conditions. If it's too hot, if it's too cold, if there's something attacking the bacteria, then they won't then the population won't reproduce like that but under ideal conditions in a petri dish. That is how their population will go up. So, If a petri dish has 100 bacteria, to start with, write a formula. I'm going to remove the word if here. That doesn't really work. So let's just say a petri dish has 100 bacteria to start with. Write a formula for how many E. coli bacteria will be in the dish. after T hours. OK. Well, let's do it. Now we know what the formula looks like here. So. We have our initial value, which is A, and our growth or decay factor, which is the amount that the quantity is multiplied by every time period. So our initial value is easy. It's 100. Now we still need our B. So what, anyone care to hazard a guess? What is our B? What is the growth factor here? By what will our function, what number will, what number will our quantity multiply by every hour?
every hour, our bacteria population will multiply by eight. Okay, we have our formula. Now that we have this formula, we can do a lot of things with it. How many bacteria will be in the dish after six hours. How about after 12 hours? Well, we have our formula. We can answer this pretty easily. So starting with 100 bacteria, which is really very, very few bacteria. These guys, E. coli is an itty bitty little bacterium. Oops. So how many will there be after six hours? That'd be f of six equals 100 times eight to the six. So 100 times 8 times 8 times 8 times 8 times 8 times 8. Probably better just to use a calculator on this, huh? Focus, focus. Let's see. There we go. So this would be 100 times 8 to the power of 6 which gives us 26,214,400. That's getting pretty gross. What about after 12 hours? That would be 100 times 8 to the 12. Using Desmos again. Focus. Uh oh. 6.8 .8 times 10 to the 12. So that would be about 6. Then we'd move the decimal over. 12 times. Twelve. It was 6.8 technically. OK, so after 12 hours, that is, let's see, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions. So after 12 hours, we've gone from 100 bacteria to nearly 7 trillion. And to be clear, this is a pretty realistic number for the amount of bacteria in a petri dish. Your gut uses bacteria as part of your as part of your digestion, and your gut has about forty trillion bacteria. So, this is not an unrealistic number for real life. So, now, in real life, you know the bacteria can't just reproduce endlessly. Eventually, they'll run out of food, and the population will crash. Um, uh, but until then. 
bacteria reproduction just goes up, 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 up. So exponential growth is very, very powerful. And it can take sm small initial quantities and, depending on the growth rate, blow it up very, very quickly. This also explains why food goes bad. Even if you take perfectly sterile food, well cooked, just a few bacteria on it, if it's left unrefrigerated and they can reproduce without, without restraint, will blow up to really gross very quickly. Okay. So, will anyone yell at me if I take this away? All right. Okay, so that was a pretty basic example. Now let's crank it up a little bit. Okay, so it's pretty easy to write these formulas when uh, you are told the growth factor right away. We are told the growth factor per hour was eight. But very often the growth factor isn't given directly, it's given as a percentage. For example, we might say something grows 10% per year. Or shrinks at a rate of fifty percent a month, fifteen percent a month. In these situations, we should use a different, a different, a slightly different set of formulas. It's just a rewriting of the formula we already saw, uh, but it works, but it works with percentages better than the other formula. Okay. Okay, so in those situations, we should use these models. 
first is the exponential growth model. There's also the exponential decay model. Exponential growth is things that grow rapidly over, or that grow uh, with a constant rate over time, with a constant uh, factor over time, like say bacteria growth. Exponential decay Exponential decay represents a uh, decreasing with a constant percentage over time. Okay, so the exponential growth formula looks something like this. Our exponential growth model. The exponential decay model looks something like this. Okay, so for exponential growth, we can use the model a times one plus r to the t. For exponential decay, we can use a times one minus r to the t. Okay, what is a, what is r? a is the same thing it was before. Oops. a is the initial value. R is the percentage growth or decay rate expressed as a decimal in t is the time unit, whatever we're using. Minutes, hours, days, years, months, weeks. Now, note that I'm saying that R is the percentage growth rate expressed as a decimal. So as a reminder, percents can be written as a decimal by dividing by 100. Which moves the decimal two places left. So for example, five percent is the same as zero point zero five. Percent even means divide by 100. Per means divide and cent means 100, like century or cents. 100 cents in a dollar, 100 years in a century. 
So you can always convert a percentage to a decimal by dividing by 100. OK, I'll give you guys about 30 seconds. Oh, should copy this down. Hmm. Yawn. Okay. So, will anyone yell at me if I take this away? All right. Now let's go ahead and use these formulas. Give me just a moment, I'm writing out a problem. Okay. So let's say that you drink a latte with 214 milligrams of caffeine. The caffeine is metabolized and leave the, leaves the bloodstream at a rate of about 8% per hour. So let's write a formula for the amount of caffeine in your blood after 24 hours. Now, basically, all drugs work this way. They are absorbed by your body at a constant percentage rate. So uh, whether this is true for caffeine or this is ca true for caffeine or um, uh, Tylenol or morphine, they are absorbed by our body at a constant percentage rate. So this kind of model would work for, for, other, for other drugs and medicines as well, though the rate might change. Okay, so we need to write a, mo a formula for the amount of caffeine in our blood after T hours. And then we need to figure out how much remains in our blood after one hour, after two hours, and after 24 hours. OK, so let's do this one together. So it should be pretty straightforward. Now, first of all, we need to figure out if this is exponential growth or exponential decay. Will the blood in our, first of, so if something is experiencing exponential growth, that means that it's going up over time. Whereas if something is experiencing exponential decay, it's going down over time. Well, let's see. 
if I drink coffee, I don't drink coffee and then the amount of caffeine in my blood starts going up, 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 up for the rest of my life. I don't get hopped up on caffeine and then more and more hopped up on caffeine every hour for the every hour till the end of time. I start with an amount of caffeine and then it starts to fade. I get perked up and then less perky for, with every hour. So this is going to be exponential decay. So we have our formula for exponential decay, right, or for exponential decay right here. Okay, so first A. Somebody help me out. What is our initial value? How much caffeine is in our blood at first? How much caffeine do we start with? Well, you st start by getting the caffeine from your drink, 214. So our A is 214 times B. So B is going to be 1 plus R, or sorry, this is decay. So it's going to be 1 minus R, our growth rate, or in this case, our decay rate. Our decay rate is 8%, so we need to express that as a decimal. 8%, if we take the decimal and move it left twice, 8% is 0 0.08. So this is really 0 0.08 to the T. And this whole thing simplifies to 214. Let's see, 1 minus 0 0.08. That's a, uh, you can use a calculator, 0 0.92 to the T. And we have our formula. Now let's use it. So let's find out how much remains after one hour. Well, after one hour, T is one. So that's F of one equals 214 times 0 0.92 to the one. Using our calculator or Desmos. After one hour, there's 196 grams remaining. Okay, how much is remaining after two hours? Well, 
Well, let's see. Raising it to the second power gives us 181. So 214 times 0 0.92 to the second power equals 181.13. but after 24 hours. That would be 214 times 0 0.92 to the 24th. Using our calculator. 28.9 grams are remaining. Or milligrams. All right. So we can actually come to a conclusion here. Now, first, <clears throat> okay, so we started with 214. So to go from 214 to 196, it decreased by a, it decreased by something like 18 milligrams in the first hour. So we lost about 18 milligrams in the first hour. In the second hour, we lost about 15 milligrams. So you see that each hour we're losing a little less. The less caffeine is in our blood, the slower our body will metabolize it. Now, what this means is that the more time passes and the less there is, the slower it, the slower your body uses it up. Now let's take a look at, let's go ahead and graph this. Oops. Using a, using Desmos. Oh. Mm. Um. Okay, so if we go ahead and just graph our function here, f of t equals 214 times 0 0.92 to the t, Oh, it should be, Desmos only knows how to recognize X. There we go. Boom. Zoom out. Okay, zoom out a little more. Here we go. So as we can see, at first, our body is metabolizing the caffeine quickly. It's falling off very quickly. That's, you know, your initial, um, uh, that's your initial perk from the coffee. But over time, you have less caffeine, which means our body is metabolizing it slower. Now you still have some, and you might even, you still have some though. But after 12 hours, you are far less than you started with. After 24 hours, you're way down here. After 50 hours, you're way down here. Now the thing I'd like you to note is that it takes a long time. You know, after, at, after 72 hours, we're at half a milligram. So there's still some in the bloodstream, even after three days. It's not enough for you to feel, but it's still there. And that's because of this asymptotic curve we have here. No matter how far we follow this to the right, it never quite reaches zero. Now, this doesn't mean that if you drink coffee once, there's always caffeine in your bloodstream in real life. This is where the model kind of doesn't necessarily represent real life very well. But the important thing is that it does take a long time for drugs like caffeine or Tylenol or anything else 
to leave your system. Now, one of the ways that this is relevant in real life is because of things like drug tests. Very sensitive drug tests can, sent, can detect even these very minute, these very tiny levels of a drug in someone's blood. So really sensitive, really sensitive drug tests for things like THC, the active and great chemical in uh, marijuana base in, in marijuana, those tests can detect those tiny little amounts even after like a month after it was last used. So that's something that is important in uh, criminal justice. Of course, the longer, for those longer periods of time, the, the test gets less and less reliable. But the point is, is that there can be detectable amounts of a drug like caffeine or Tylenol or THC in someone's bloodstream for a very long time. All right. Now I'd like you to try doing a problem yourself. So let's talk about art. Now, art from a famous artist will, will uh, appreciate in value. So over time, an artist, the work for, of an artist can get, will get more and more valuable. This is called appreciation. So let's say that we have a painting. And it is getting more valuable at a rate of 5% per year. And it is worth $1,000 now. I would like you to write a formula to find its value after t years. Then I would like you to find its value after a decade and after a century. Give it a try. Give you about two minutes.
All right. So, we need to write a formula for its value after t years. So it's getting more value, valuable every year, so it's experiencing exponential growth. So it will be using the formula a times, a times 1 plus r to the t. a is our starting value, which is 1,000. Easy enough. What about r? Well, r is not just 5, because remember that we need to convert the percentage to a decimal. 5 divided by 100 is 0 0.05. So it's 1 plus 0 0.05, which is, of course, 1.05. The t. All right. So now we can find its value after a decade and after a century. Well, a decade is 10 years. So that's going to be 1,000 times 1 1.05 to the power of 10. And the century would be 1.05 to the power of 100. Let's take a look. Let's see, using our calculator or Desmos, let me see. Our initial value is 1,000. Our growth factor is 1.05, and we want to know its value after 10 years, $1,628. After 100 years, it's worth $131,000. So we can see how something's value can go up dramatically over time. Maybe not right away, but once, but once that exponential growth starts kicking in after, after a while, its value can go up and can go up precipitously. Precipitous meaning steep. Well, anyway, and that, I think, is about that. So, today we learned how to express or how to use rational functions to model real life situations. We saw how we could do this with bacteria, in which we were just given the growth factor right away. And we saw how we could also write these formulas, uh, formulas for percentage growth or percentage decay. All right, well, anyway, that is about it for today's lesson. Now, as a reminder, tomorrow is parent-teacher conferences, so I hope to see your parents tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow there will not be a regular Zoom lesson. I will be... Let's see. Tomorrow we'll not have a regular Zoom. Tomorrow we'll not have a regular Zoom lesson. Um, uh, instead, I'll give you a review worksheet like usual. And I will see you guys tomorrow. So, or no, I'll see you guys Monday. So have a great day. I hope to see your see you and your parents tomorrow at tomorrow in the afternoon. And uh, yeah, see you around. Have a great day.